Hi, everyone. Welcome to Artist Talk. I'm Juliana Ferreiro, and today I'm talking with acclaimed photographer Walter Griffin. Our conversation is going to be a fun ride covering his dynamic career. From photos of ladies in church hats to jazz icons, from his trips to Africa to his passion from cycling, we're going to talk about it all. Stay tuned. Today, I'm thrilled to welcome Walter Griffin to the Artist Talk today. Walter, welcome. Thank you so much. I'm so glad to be here, finally. It's been two years of preparing for this exhibition. It's, been, it's been a long time just waiting and, and anticipation, yes. And uh, so let's, let's just start, let's dig in. We're really curious to find out how did this project of Women in Hats got started? Can, can you share with us what was your inspiration? Well, it started a long time ago because when I was young, I used to um, see a, a, a milliner for the first time. And this is the first time I ever saw anyone really create something Uh, artistically when I was eight years old and it fascinated me that um, um, her name was Miss Sorrell and she would be having conversation with my dad and her husband and I would just be there and I would just be mesmerized by the fact that she was talking and it was like she was actually working and not really paying any attention and she was doing fabric and and feathers. I I was just amazed. And from what you remember, how long did it take her to create these hats? Because they can be really elaborate. Well, sometimes I would be over there for like four hours and she would create several hats within the, in the four hour period. Okay. That requires a lot of, a lot of talent. And so <laughs> when did you decide to start documenting? the women, and, the, and the, particularly the ones that we see in the exhibition? Oh, um, <clears throat> the Guthrie Theater in, in Minnesota decided to stage the play Crowns. And um, the assistant director knew that I had been photographing ladies in hats. And she approached me into doing an, an exhibit, but she wanted to call it Twin Cities Hattitude. And all the ladies had to be from the Twin Cities. And how did you, how did you went to find um, these ladies? Did you attended church services or there were ladies, women that you already knew? How did you came about? Because they look so relaxed in the photographs. They're so comfortable posting for you and also showing her their different number of hats. So how did you find them? So what I did was I, I went to various churches and I solicited some of the women that I, that I knew, and we used to have hat parties and the ladies would bring their friends and I would set up a backdrop and lights. And, um, I would, we would just have a party and that's how I would begin to photograph them. This, this project was kind of involved, but I only had a certain amount of time to complete it. That's very, that's very impressive especially because i thought that you knew them for a long time because they're so comfortable with you so i get that that vouches for your extensive career um in in photography i know that you've done other types of projects so can you share with us what else you have in your portfolio well i i, I have been photographing for 67 years and so I have a lot of things. I, um, I first started documenting people and doing street photography and I, I'm, I love jazz. So I started photographing jazz musicians and I probably have photographed jazz musicians for 40 years. I was fortunate enough to go to school in, uh, in West Africa and Ghana. And so I got a chance to, um, really photograph the people, the places, ce celebrations, And um, that is what really inspired me. But I, I made a pledge a long time ago that I would only create 
positive images of people. And, um, and so that has been my quest for all my life. So it's fascinating what you mentioned about West Africa and wanting to document the positive. Can you expand a little bit more on that? I'm curious to see how you got that opportunity to go to Africa. And let, let's talk about this a little bit more. So when, when I was younger, um, my idol at the time had been Gordon Parks. And Gordon Parks and I, uh, I, I got to know Gordon when I was eight years old. And as a matter of fact, I got to work in his dark room. Um, he started a dark room at the Southside Community Arts Center. So I kept in contact with him for over 50 years. And so one of the things that he imparted to me was to always continue to create your own style so that you wouldn't be duplicating anyone else. You know, you had to, when people saw your work, they needed to say, that's a Walter Griffin piece. And um, Gordon was so dynamic and so fascinating and faceted in all the various things that he did, you know, besides being a, a photographer, a filmmaker, a composer, a poet. Um, and, and, and so I was really inspired by him at an early age, but I decided that I would try to be a filmmaker. So I, I went to uh, graduate school to be a filmmaker, but only to discover that I was an eternal still photographer because I could have complete control over the entire medium, you know, because with, with still photographs, I could see the image, uh, I could capture the image, I could develop the film, I could make the print, I could cut the mat, I could frame frame it and then put it on the wall. So I saw the whole process that way. Whereas with film, it required so much work. For example, to really create a five minute film would take over 400 hours, you know? So with um, shooting it, directing it, uh, all the other various things. And then this was back when you were shooting film, you had to splice the voice in. This is before video. So long time ago, this was over 40 some odd years ago. So the, the, the medium has really changed. So, but I discovered my true calling, which was still photography. It's, it's, it's impressive, um, you know, to learn that you were inspired by such an, an icon and not only inspired, but get to work together and remain in contact with, with Gordon Parks to me. I'm, I'm, I'm in awe. And um, what you mentioned before about each photographer having their own styles, I want to circle back to this opportunity that you have of uh, taking photographs of women in hats to accompany the, the play. Rounds. When I was doing the research for for this exhibition, I came across the book with that title, with photographs by Michael Cunningham, and it also has the stories behind each of the of the photographs. So I wanted to ask you, um, uh, how have you have you seen, have been in contact with with Michael Cunningham? Have you seen his photographs, and what is your take? Well, I, I saw I saw the book, um, and I met him um, at my exhibit. Um, at Crowns in Minneapolis, he came. Um, he came, and you know, we spoke for a while. Our styles are different. His his work was black and white, and mine was colored. And uh, he was really fascinated with my work. I have have a good friend in California who worked for Ebony, and I called him. I told him I met Michael, and um, and what he said. He said. You probably scared him to death when you when he looked at your photographs, you know, just like that. But how with with the thing about crowns, I had been photographing ladies in hats for a long time. And and one day I, I was having lunch with um, this, a professor at the university and, and she said, Walter, I'm sorry to tell you, but somebody stole your thunder. Someone got a book out before you. I said, well. What can I say? You know, it, it, things like that happen. So, yeah. That, that, that's interesting. Um, 
Because, I mean, like you said, I mean, their styles are completely different. And yeah. even if you look at the two photographs from without having either one of your names, you can tell which one is a Walter Griffin, which one is right. a Michael Cunningham. Right. But it was really interesting because, uh, to me, all, all this uh, is very new. So looking and reading at the book, reading about your story, what I found online, it, it's fascinating. And I know that the community in Pompano Beach are going to welcome this exhibition huge i mean we already have received uh, great comments from the staff as they seen uh, your photographs and um, i want to know more because when we were planning this exhibition i know that you're kind of like a jack of all trades you not only do photography but uh, there's other hobbies that take your great great number of hours in your life so do you want to share about what, what what other passions you have in life um yeah i I'm really involved with the uh, cycling community in the United States. So I'm one of the founding members of Major Taylor, uh, Minnesota, and also Major Taylor, Chicago. And Major Taylor is uh, a cycling organization um, named after Walter Marshall Major Taylor, who was the first um, black um, world champion in the years of 1898 to 1901 and that was uh, he raced on the velodrome and he held the mile um he held the mile championship time yeah and you 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 funded that a while ago so you're super active in that community correct yeah i yeah founded that like 21 years ago and um you know before that, I was involved with an, another group called the um, Black Photographic Collaborative. Uh, the purpose was to help other black budding photographers to give them an idea of what it takes to be a professional, but at the same time to exhibit. So one of the things that we did was um, we got together and I told him that I would find places for us to exhibit and we would collaborate on that. And um, after they would do the exhibit, I would make sure that everyone got a check and um, for hanging for hanging their work up on the wall. And of course, they had no idea that this was really happening. So they told me I was lying. How was that going to happen? Because they had no idea that you could get paid for showing your work. And so we did the first exhibit and everybody got a check. And then after that, they were in love with me. You know, so that is how that started. Um, later on, after I moved from Austin, Texas to Minneapolis, I continued to do the same thing. Um, I was fortunate enough that when I moved here, I, I already had a good reputation as being a uh, a known photographer. So I was featured on some of the uh, television stations. And through that, I was able to find and meet other photographers. And we started the same thing um, to make sure that they would exhibit, um, they would get paid. And we did a number of exhibitions together. So that's how that came together. This is great. I mean, I, I imagine that the numbers in your organization grew, I guess, like once they start seeing that you were growing the creative economy, that even nowadays, is it still somehow, uh, well, I wouldn't say taboo, but it's just still unheard of for many artists that they can get paid to participate in the, in the, in the creative well, art. I, you know, I think it's so important that, you know, you create... Um, and you show your work, but at the same time, you need to be compensated, you know, because it requires a lot of training, a lot of time and a lot of materials. And it's good to to show, but it's better to get paid because we all have to eat. We all have to live. There are a lot of things that requires us to to be paid. So um, that's my encouraging. I'm always encouraging young people. I mean, I've gotten calls about, would you do this? Do, you know, and I said, okay, I'll do it, but this is uh, how much it costs. And, you know, you, and people need to be ready to know exactly how much they're going to charge. And that was one of the things that I wanted to make sure that other photographers knew. And if they really didn't know how much to charge, then they needed to call someone because you always judge 
So what happens if one black photographer messes up, then every black photographer is part of that. So I just wanted to make sure that people realize that everyone is responsible for the example that you set. So, yeah. I'm impressed. I'm impressed because you were not only a practicing artist, but you were a mentor for fellow photographers and, and artists because they were they were learning the trade and they were learning that there's so much value in each person's work. So so I I um I committed to the organization for 25 years in Minnesota. And uh, you know, after a while you can work in an organization, but when all the work falls on you, it it becomes tiring. And so I I got exhausted from it. And uh, around that time, my um, son had gotten a football scholarship to Northwestern University right outside of um, Chicago. And so I transitioned into this group called the Chicago Alliance of African American Photographers. And And it was like the organization that I was involved in, but the only thing that I had to do was consult with them. So because I had already done this. So we got together and uh, we exhibited, we produced a book and, and, and so they are still um, functioning. And so I'm, 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 I'm glad that I've had an opportunity to, to be involved with it. And besides that, They are operating out of the Southside Community Arts Center, w the place where Gordon Parks started his dark room. So it's 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 really historic too. Yeah, that's impressive. I mean, it's kind of coming coming for circle. Yes, full circle. Yeah, full circle. And so we're, we've been talking all these things that you've done. Are you involved with any organizations now, or are, do you have any plans for the future? Well, um, I'm still mentoring. Um, I was fortunate enough to teach photography um, in the Twin Cities, and I'm sure that I have probably taught thousands of, of students over the last 30 years. And so I still see students, you know, primarily I work with young people and and multicultural. So I work with Native Americans. I, I work with uh, um, white students, um, uh, a variety of students and 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 so the the thing that i've always tried to impart to them is that you will always do photography regardless to whatever you do but remember that you are becoming a visual historian whether you do it for yourself or for your family and and so that is one of the things that i'm always trying to 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 teach that and also about what a good f photograph is and about preservation too, you know, because everyone has a family, everyone is taking a photograph. And at some point, if they decide to put it in a frame, they need to know that the frame needs to be matted. So, so that it's not sticking against the, the glass in the event that there's some condensation that happens. So there's more, a process of teaching all of those things that are really important to the to doing photography, especially if you want to do it for preservation. Yes. I discovered so much about you in this conversation that I didn't get to read in the two years of preparing this this show. is is fascinating, and I see absolutely the value of what you teach, and that is not only taking the photograph, but like. On my end, as a curator, when I see artwork that comes beautifully made, I can see that the effort went throughout the right. whole process, you know, even how the crates arrive, how they're packed. So it, it, it's great that you teach them the whole process and you taught it, like you said, to thousands <laughs> of, of, of students. So that's that's fabulous. And um I think that with this, we will conclude our conversation today. It's been so wonderful to have you here today on camera, real time. We can, you know, get to discuss about the exhibition. I'm in love with your exhibition as well, and it looks fabulous at Bailey Contemporary Arts. So I really appreciate the opportunity to meet you and to meet you as an artistic uh, 
my work too. Well, thank you so much. It's been a pleasure to be able to finally meet you. I mean, I, I spoke to you on the phone and um, I inquired about um, whether you knew some, someone who, who else was a curator in Houston, because I think that's where you came from. And so it, you know, it's just fascinating to actually see you live, uh, you know, because you can talk to someone on the phone, but you have no idea of what they look like. And so to have a, just a conversation and this is this has been wonderful. And I'm so happy that I am getting a chance to share my work with you, with your community and with Pomino Beach, uh, Florida. And um, I'm really excited. And, you know, fortunately, people will get a chance to to see and share and and um, and be in awe with what I've seen and what I've captured. So I really appreciate that. Thank you so much. 